طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا Welcome back everyone to our tafsir class um, which we haven't had for a very long time so it's good to see all of you back Alhamdulillah by the ni'm of Allah we continue with this uh, blessed course inshallah ta'ala and as most of you are aware uh, to avoid uh, cancelling lessons often uh, we have made an academic calendar that we can abide by inshallah which will give us more consistency so even though the lessons might not be week in week out as it was meant to be before at least it is more structured you know exactly when the lessons are going to be you know when uh, there is going to be a break you know everything advance in advance so that you can plan your time accordingly plan your holidays accordingly likewise we also scheduled in a week for revision and testing the previous knowledge that we have so instead of just doing lesson after lesson week after week every four weeks we stop and we revise what we did and we do an exam inshallah ta'ala so i've shared the academic calendar on the telegram channel uh, if you haven't joined the telegram channel yet of course you should join i always say that's our single source of truth inshallah that's where i post everything and all updates regarding the class uh, you can join both you can join the main channel you can also join the dedicated channel for the tafsir class i've just posted it in the zoom chat for those of you that need it and inshallah those of you that are watching this on youtube you'll find it in the description or in the comments below so please join the uh, channel you'll find the academic calendar there so we are going to be teaching for the coming four weeks inshallah and then we're going to have a break okay uh, so since we had a very long break we're going to do a very quick uh, overview or recap of where we are in Surah Al-Baqarah specifically because there might be a lot of you that are new to this class that haven't joined before so Literally in five minutes, we'll try and uh, five, ten minutes, give a quick recap, okay? So, uh, obviously we started the Tafsir course by... First we did an introduction to uh, the Tafsir course where we talked about Quranic studies, Quranic sciences, the science of Tafsir, the books of Tafsir, that that we've done in, uh, over four sessions. Then we've done Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillah, uh, six classes in total. And then we started with Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, the first lesson we talked about, introduction to Surah Al-Baqarah, its names and virtues, revelation, and the main theme of Surah Al-Baqarah. Then we went on and covered the first couple of ayat, which talks about the Quran being a book of guidance. Okay? And more specifically, a book of guidance for the muttaqun. We talked about that. We talked about taqwa and why it's a guidance for them and not for others. Then we talked about the three categories of people when it comes to guidance and when it comes to the Quran. So in Surah Al-Fatiha we asked Allah for guidance and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah that this book is a guidance, okay? But this guidance itself, this guidance itself, we can categorize the people into three different categories when it comes to how they um, accept this guidance, okay? So those three groups were the mu'min, the believer, and the kafir, the disbeliever, and the munafiq. Okay, so Allah talks about those three categories. Okay, in practice. There's a fourth category in theory. We've talked about what that means. But these are the three uh, that Allah talks about at the beginning of the surah. Basically telling us that no matter the benefits and the ayat and the lessons and the guidance that is that this Quran contains, not everyone is going to benefit from it. Okay? So Allah told us this so that we make sure that we are from the muttaqun and that we stay away from and we try not to be from the kafirun and munafiqun. Because if we're from those two categories and the Quran will not benefit us. Okay? Then Allah talks about, talks about the first obligation in the Quran. After talking about those three categories in detail, Specifically the munafiqun, Allah mentioned in, in great detail, which shows us their danger. Allah talked about the first obligation, which is Tawheed. 
توش بي ملون يا أيها الناس اتقوا رب يا أيها الناس اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون so the first thing Allah commanded us with in his Quran is the tawheed of Allah سبحانه وتعالى توش بي ملون okay it is the first command the most important command and the number one thing that will determine your destination in the hereafter then Allah سبحانه وتعالى mentioned a few analogies um Allah talked about the analogies in the Quran and how our um, attitude should be towards them. Yes. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the disbelievers. The greatest challenge ever Allah has presented to the mushrikun and this challenge stands until today to prove that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that challenge being come with a Quran similar to this Quran if you're truthful. And nobody has uh, stood up to this challenge. 1400 years later, this challenge still stands showing us that the book, this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described paradise. Okay, so if you fulfill that first obligation, then you look forward to paradise. So Allah has told us what the first obligation is. He's warned against the mushrikun and, 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 and them taking besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, false deities. And then Allah ta'ala described paradise. And we talked about that in detail and how Allah described paradise return back to that lesson inshallah then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, there's an ayah that mentions how can you disbelieve in Allah we talked about that as well then we spend a good four lectures on the story of Adam and Iblis subhanallah so many benefits to be taken from this story and inshallah hopefully we'll package this whole story of Adam and Iblis at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah maybe into a separate course you know a four, four lesson course that you can take and share with others immense benefits to be taken from this story from it we benefited the importance of knowledge from it we benefited the importance of submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Iblis and his animosity to us yes um, and the, how our lives started here on earth it talked about the creation of Adam the status of knowledge Iblis and his refusal, refusal to prostrate for Adam and what that t- teaches us about Iblis Adam's sin and repentance and we talked about the contrast between Iblis's sin and Adam's sin they both sinned but one Allah forgave and he became a prophet and a messiah a prophet and the other is he has been cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what is the difference we mentioned that in detail then we talked about how life in our, on earth started the descent of Adam alayhi salam to earth and Iblis that's what that's where it all started so the beginning of the quran is telling us the origins how it all started why are you here why are you here on earth okay and we mentioned a few beneficial points regarding that so all of this if you like is like an introduction right an introduction um showing us what the quran is about generally speaking yes and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i mean you know in surah al-fatiha you ask allah for guidance this first part of the surah talks about that guidance yes and it, the Allah mentions that after the descent to earth Allah said huda. if a guidance comes to you from me then whoever uh, follows my guidance then there's no fear upon him or any grief okay all of this related to the guidance but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started talking about Banu Israel okay so what do we take from that it is the same thing when it comes to Surah Al-Fatiha. In Surah Al-Fatiha, you ask Allah for guidance. But in order to attain guidance, you also need to stay away from its opposite. And we mentioned that in Surah Al-Fatiha, people are of three categories. You have those who have guidance. We said guidance is knowledge in action. So those that have knowledge and act upon it, they are Al-Mun'am alayhim, those Allah blessed. Okay? Then you have Al-Maghdubi alayhim, those who Allah is angry with. We said they are those who have the knowledge but they don't act upon it. And then الضالين, the misguided ones. They are the ones who act and worship Allah without knowledge. Okay? So having given us this introduction to guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against falling into the same traps and following the footsteps of المغضوب عليهم, those who Allah is angry with. They are those who have the knowledge but they don't act upon it. So Allah gives us a historical lesson from Banu Israel and how their destruction was because of that. Why? So that we don't follow for fall into their footsteps. And we will follow them in their footsteps, unfortunately. Like the Prophet Muhammad said. 
That's why we mentioned at the beginning of this, we said that any advice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to Bani Israel, it's an advice to us. Why? Because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that we will follow the footsteps of the Jews and the Christians, uh, those that came before us. Okay? Hadhul Quddati Bil Qudda. Footstep by footstep will follow them. Okay? So because of that being the reality, and because of the fact that the Ummah, unfortunately, this is its greatest weakness, being infatuated with those two nations that came before us and looking up to them and following them in their footsteps, anything that Allah gives in terms of advice to Banu Israel in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's an advice to us, advice to us as well, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you'll find the Surah Al-Baqarah starting from this point all the way until we get halfway to the Surah. It's all about talking about Banu Israel, what they've done, uh, the, the mistakes they fell into, all of that for us to take lessons from it and make sure that we don't follow them in their footsteps. So that's where we are. Advice to Banu Israel. This, these couple of ayat were giving them specific advice and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about their history okay and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first reminds them of his blessings okay so here Allah advised them and now and then Allah reminds them of their blessings so we covered that in the previous lessons okay the last lesson which brings us to today's lesson the last lesson we stopped at was titled how did Banu Israel repay Allah's favors okay so Allah has advised them and Allah Ta'ala has recounted his blessings upon Banu Israel. Now the question is, how did they repay Allah's favors? Okay, that's where we are. Okay, so last lesson we talked about the fact that after Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala delivered them from Fir'aun, who enslaved them and humiliated them and killed their young boys. After Allah saved them from Fir'aun, Okay, and Musa alayhi salam went out to meet his Lord for 30 days initially and then the meeting was increased by, 30, by 10 days, it became 40 nights. وَإِذْ وَعَدْنَا مُوسَىٰ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً Musa alayhi salam was gone for 40 nights. During those 40 nights, they fell back into shirk. What kind of shirk? Worshipping a calf made of gold. Now imagine that. Unbelievable. So Allah talked about that. How Banu Israel worshipped a calf during Musa's meeting with Allah. What a crime. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Did he condemn all of them to eternal hellfire with no chance of redeeming themselves? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us his forbearance to his slaves. He says, Allah says, then after that, we forgave you so that you might give shukr. Okay? We talked about shukr and what shukr is and the difference between shukr and hamd. And then Allah mentioned, yes, one of his greatest blessings upon them, again, telling them what they should be thankful for, which is the fact that Allah gave Musa the Torah. While they were busy worshipping the calf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving Musa the Torah in which there is guidance for them. The criterion between truth and falsehood. Musa came back with the Al-Wah, he came back with the Torah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote with his own two hands. And during that short period of time, they were worshipping the calf already. Subhanallah. Okay? So we talked about that, we talked about the main takeaways. Again, this is the last lesson that we did. And how many of this ummah go astray due to ignorance and many of them due to the following of desires and stubbornness upon falsehood. We talked about that. Because again, here the Jews, they didn't worship the calf out of ignorance. That was pure stubbornness and following of desires. Musa alayhi salam was calling them to Tawheed. When Musa came to Fir'aun, he came with Tawheed. And Allah Ta'ala delivered them because of Tawheed. And within 40 days they were committing shirk again. Okay? And unfortunately that's also the state of many of the of the of, 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 of the of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Falling into misguidance out of stubbornness and 
following of desires. We talked about that anyway. Now today, we are going to talk about their repentance from worshipping the calf. Okay, so that's where we were. So that was a quick recap if you like what we did. Um, and now we continue from where we left off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال موسى لقومه يا قوم إنكم ظلمتم أنفسكم باتخاذكم العجل فتوبوا إلى بارئكم فقتلوا أنفسكم ذلكم خير لكم عند بارئكم فتاب عليكم إنه هو التواب الرحيم And remember, O oh Muhammad, when Musa said to his people, O oh my people, indeed you have done zulm upon yourselves. Okay? Now, those of you that are not aware, I normally, this is basically a translation which is, uh, I go through some of the famous translations and mix and match here and there, see which, which ones are the easiest. But uh, one difference you'll find here is that any Arabic word that can't be directly translated to English then what I normally do is I color them I mention them in Arabic within the ayah and then we go over their meanings afterwards okay because there's no point um, writing the English here if it can't be translated directly into English okay and if we try to do that within the ayah itself the ayah is gonna get too wordy okay so we'll come to these words here that you like that are in different colors. So these colors as well, they've got meanings. Um, so the purple means it's an entity or if you like a proper noun, someone basically. Green means it's a mustalah or terminology, religious terminology you should know. And we'll come across the other colors as well, inshallah. So we have here, it says, Oh my people, indeed you have done zulm upon yourselves. How? By your taking of the calf for worship. As you can see, for worship here is in between square brackets because that hasn't been mentioned in the Arabic. Okay, Allah says, uh, by your taking of the calf. So, what does that mean? By how? What does that mean? Now, in Arabic, ittikhadh or ittakhadha is a verb that it has two objects or two maf'ulun bihis. Okay, to take something as something. Okay, so this actually means ilahan. But ilahan has been omitted. And this is from the way of the Arabs in which their language, the Quran, has been revealed. Whereby they omit things that, make, that are already understood in way of context. Anything that's, that can be understood clearly through the context of the speech, then the Arabs they have a tendency to omit those kind of things. That's why Arabic is a very concise language. Okay? But then, when you try and take that and literally translate it to English, unless you have that level of knowledge in Arabic, or unless you turn back to the books of Tafsir to know what has been omitted, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time translating things properly. And we mentioned this one major issue when it comes to what they call the translations of the Quran. There is no translation of the Quran. There's nothing but translation of the meanings of the Quran. And if this person who's translating the Quran doesn't know the correct meaning of the Quran, then what is he going to do? He's going to mistranslate the meanings of the Quran. He's going to translate the Quran according to his understanding. Because the Quran can't be translated directly, word for word. That's why if you go to the translations of the Quran, so-called, you'll find that they miss out on this crucial information by your taking of the calf for worship. Some of them, they miss out on this. And the examples for this are many. Allah al -musta'an. Even in, in Surah Al-Fatiha, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We said that the fact that إِيَّاكَ has been brought forward, i.e. the object, it shows us that only Allah should be worshipped. So it basically means you alone we worship, and you alone is not something that has been explicitly stated, it's something that's understood from the structure of the sentence. You'll find that a lot of the translators of the Quran, as they say, have missed out on that crucial information. So they translate إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ as we worship you. This is wrong. This is not a statement of Tawheed. Because Quraysh, the Mushrikun also used to worship Allah. Okay? Tawheed is not to worship Allah. Tawheed is to worship Allah alone. And that's why Iyyaka means you alone we worship. Because Taqdeem Al-Maf'ul 
or تقديم العامل على المعمول يفيد الحصر that's a principle okay so if someone doesn't know that Arabic principle or that usuli principle he's going to mistranslate what he deems to be the meanings of the Quran طيب so Allah says oh my people indeed you've done zulm upon yourselves by taking of the calf for worship so repent, repent to your bari, bari'ikum, your bari, and kill yourselves. Okay, so this statement here needs to be explained. Okay, what is meant by kill yourselves? We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, that is best for all of you with your bari. And then he accepted your repentance. Truly he is a tawab al-rahim. Truly Allah is a tawab al-rahim. Taib. what does zul mean? Zulm, obviously, it is loosely translated as injustice, okay? But uh, zulm, in a literal sense, it means to deprive something or decrease something. It means to decrease something, okay? And here in this context, it means doing zulm upon yourselves is depriving yourself of your rights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you rights. There are things you're entitled to. But when you commit shirk or you sin, then you deprive yourself of your rights. Okay, like Sheikh Ibn Uthameen mentions here, he says, وَظَلَمْتُمْ بِمَعْنَى نَقَصْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ حَقَّهَا You have decreased or you have deprived yourselves of your own rights. Because ظلم في الأصل بمعنى النقص. ظلم originally means to decrease something and he gave a, an ayah from the Quran to prove that كِلْتَ الْجَنَّتَيْنِ آتَدْ أُكُولَهَا وَلَمْ تَظْلِمْ مِنْهُ شَيْعًا okay بمعنى النقص um, that's the asal so he says here that the meaning is نَقَصْتُمُوهَا حَقَّهَا وَذَلِكَ بِمُخَالَفَةِ التَّوْحِيدِ you have deprived yourself of your own rights by opposing and not implementing and upholding tawheed because we all know the hadith of uh, the hadith of Mu'adh radiyallahu anh where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, asked Mu'adh ma haqqu Allahi ala al-ibad wa ma haqqu al-ibadi ala Allah what is the rights of Allah upon his servants and what's the, serv- what's the right of the servant upon Allah the right that Allah has upon his servants is that they worship him alone and don't associate any partners with him in worship so what is our right our right is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish those who worship him alone. Okay? وَحَقُّ الْعِبَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ أَلَّا يُعَذِّبَ مَنْ لَا يُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْعًا The right of the servants is that Allah doesn't punish them if they worship Allah alone. So right now, Banu Israel have been punished for their crime. Which is, the worshipping of the calf. Were they entitled to punishment before they committed shirk? No. They were entitled to the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were entitled to not being punished. Because that, that was their right. So my dear brothers my dear brothers and sisters, yes, as long as you implement tawheed and don't commit shirk, then Allah will not make zulm of you. Allah will never إِنِّي حَرَّمْتُ الظُّلْمَ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِي Allah has made zulm haram upon himself. Allah will never put, uh, Allah will not punish you in the hellfire. Allah Taala will not punish you in the hellfire and make you stay in the hellfire for eternity if you come with tawheed. Now if you come with major sins, you might be punished, but not for eternity. And Allah might forgive you. Okay? So the greatest oppression a person can do upon himself is that he commits shirk because if he commits shirk he will have deprived himself of the right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy such that Allah doesn't punish him right. then we have bari what does bari mean? bari means creator bari means creator originator okay the one who creates something without any inspiration from a previous creation so you'll find that human beings, whatever, whatever they call, what they call innovation, what they call 
uh, creations, it's always based on something they've seen before. They might tweak it and change it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us without any previous example or, or inspiration that He took from another creator. He's created us. That's one thing. Uh, so Ibn Kathir, he mentions that Al-Bari means creator. So turn in repentance to your Bari that it means to your creator. Okay? So why did Allah say Bari'ikum? Okay? Why did Allah say Bari'ikum? In particular? Then Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, he says that فَتُوبُوا إِلَىٰ بَارِئِكُمْ مَا قَالَ إِلَىٰ اللَّهِ وَلَا قَالَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ Allah didn't say تُوبُوا إِلَىٰ اللَّهِ Allah didn't say تُوبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ Why? To show the grave nature of their sin. Because Bari, okay, it means creator but it's different from Al-Khaliq. All of you might know that Al-Khaliq means the creator. And we said Al-Bari also means the creator. A typical example of not being able to translate a word from Arabic to English. Because now you got two words that are different. Okay, they have differences. Uh, but we have to translate them both as creator. But that doesn't mean bari means khaliq, 100%. La, there's a difference. In Arabic, there's a difference. What's the difference? The difference is that al bari is the creator who gives great care. So not just a creator. A creator, someone might create something and not care about it and ch 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 chuck it into a side, create and then die. that's it. La. Allah Taala didn't just create us and then just throw us and disregard us. La. Allah Taala created us and He gives us great care. He looks after us, sends us messengers, gives us sustenance, sustenance, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this type of creator who is Al Bari, how can you? Then worship others besides him. So Shaykh Ibn Uthameen says, لِأَنَّ الْبَارِي بِمَعْنَ الْخَالِقَ الْمُعْتَنِي خَالِقُ الْمُعْتَنِي فَكَأَنَّهُ يَقُولُ كَيْفَ تَتَّخِذُونَ الْعِجْلَ إِلَاهًا وَتَدَعُونَ خَالِقَكُمْ الَّذِي يَعْتَنِي بِكُمْ How do you take a calf for worship and leave your creator who takes great care of you? التواب What is the meaning of التواب? Tawab means, it comes from the word Tawbah, Tawbah, which means repentance. But what's the meaning of Tawbah when you ascribe it to Allah? Does it mean Allah repents to us, returns to us? Of course not. Okay, so when Tawbah is ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means, from what I've gathered from the speech of the scholars, in particular the Sharaf Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, the Tafsir Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, is three things. The one who allows his servant to repent, number one. Allah gives us the ability to repent. If it wasn't for Him, we wouldn't be able to repent. And then He turns towards us. And then He accepts our repentance. Okay? So that's the gist of what Shaykh Ibn Uthameen mentioned in this tafsir. Okay? So He mentions, Tawbatullahi ala abdihi ma'nah an yarda anhu ba'd al-ghadab wa yuqbila ilayhi ba'd al-tawalli anhu al-iram. So the fact that Allah turns towards us after being angry with us, in order to accept our repentance, that's what tawab means. And the Sheikh mentions that a tawab is different from ta'ib. So both these words come from the word tawbah. Someone who does tawbah. Okay? But tawab is what we call in Arabic sigha mubalagha. This is when you do the action many times. Okay? So fa'ala, someone who does something. Fa'al, fa'al, someone who does something. Fa'al, someone who does that thing often. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not is, it doesn't just accept our repentance and turn towards us for repentance. Likewise, rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that often, continuously. Okay? So he mentions here, Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala says, Wallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala kathiru tawbah. Okay? Likathrati tawbatihi ala abdi. وَكَثِيرِ التَّوْبَ لِكَثْرَةِ مَنْ يَتُوبُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّاسِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to us, He constantly accepts our repentance. We fall into sin, we repent, Allah accepts it. We fall into sin, we repent, Allah accepts it. Constantly. And like the, 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 the hadith mentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not 
stop forgiving us as long as we seek forgiveness. Constantly Allah will accept our repentance. That's one thing. And on the other side, because of the sheer amount of people that, that Allah uh, accepts their repentance. So when it comes to us, Allah accepts our repentance, repentance constantly. And if we look at how many people return to Allah Ta'ala for repentance and He accepts their repentance? Millions and billions. Okay? That's why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is At-Tawwab. Not just Ta'ib, At-Tawwab. Okay? إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Rahim means the most merciful. We know that already. طيب. Now going back to this uh, part of the ayah, kill yourselves. Some of you might be thinking to yourselves, kill yourselves? Wait a minute. Isn't suicide haram? Did Musa alayhi salam command Banu Israel to commit suicide as a form of repentance? لا, that's not the case. Sheikh Ibn Uthameen mentions لِيَقْتُلَ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضَ It doesn't mean kill yourselves, i.e. each person kills himself. Rather, kill one another. Kill one another. Okay, so some of you kill others. Okay? Um, and he mentions وَلَيْسَ الْمَعْنَى أَنَّ كُلَّ وَاحِدٍ يَقْتُلُ نَفْسَهُ بِالْإِجْمَعِ By the consensus of the scholars, it doesn't mean that one commits suicide. And ما أحد من المفسرين قال إن معنى قوله تعالى اقتلوا أنفسكم أي كل واحد يقتل نفسه. None of the mufassirun or the people of tafsir have ever mentioned that. Okay. Um, Ibn Ibn Kathir رحمه الله mentions that Allah ordered Musa to command his people to kill each other as a form of repentance. So he ordered those who worship the calf to sit down and those who did not worship the calf to stand holding knives in their hands. So basically, and this is one of the opinion of the scholars, that it means that the innocent ones who didn't worship the calf, they kill, or if you like, execute those who were guilty of worshipping the calf. That's one opinion. Another opinion is that uh, it was uh, randomly, and not uh, particularly those who uh, committed the sin. Okay? Because Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, he has this opinion, and he says, he, and, and he he mentions that this is a stronger opinion mainly because if it meant that those that are innocent kill or execute those who are guilty then there is no that's not a form of repentance there's nothing different that is that is normal there's nothing different about that okay that's how things should be but here rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to test them commanded them that they kill each other randomly to show their remorse and their repentance. Okay? Um, so those are two different opinions. Nevertheless, whichever one is correct, Allah knows best. But um, some of Banu Israel killed others. And Ibn Kathir, he gives some details or he gives a narration that he has some more details regarding this. And he says that um, when they started killing them, a great darkness suddenly overcame them. After the darkness lifted, they had killed 70,000 of them. Those who were killed among them were forgiven and those who remained alive were also forgiven. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like He says, فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ He uh, accepted their repentance and they were forgiven. Okay? طيب. Going on to the next ayah. So we're done with the section that talks about the worshipping of the calf. So that's one of their crimes. Okay? So here we're talking about how Banu Israel repaid Allah's favors. One thing they did is worship the calf. Okay, what else did they do to repay Allah's favors? They opposed the messenger. They opposed Musa alayhi salam. Okay? And as a result, they were immediately punished. They were immediately punished. So what happened? Allah Ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ when you, And remember, when you said, Ibn Israel, what did they say? When they said to Musa, alayhi salam, لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى نَرَى اللَّهَ جَهْرَةً فَأَخَذَتْكُمُ الصَّعِيقَةُ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ And remember when you said, you, i.e. Banu Israel, 
Okay? O oh Musa, we will never believe you until we see Allah plainly. So the thunderbolt took you while you were looking on. So basically they said to Musa alayhi salam, we're not going to believe in you, we want to see Allah directly. You want to see him plainly. Okay? Um, plainly, Ibn Abbas said that the ayah, وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَىٰ لَنْ نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَىٰ نَرَى اللَّهَ جَهْرَةً He said that it means, O oh Musa, we shall never believe in you until we see Allah plainly, i.e. publicly, so that we gaze at Allah. That's what they wanted. That's what they requested. While you are looking on, Urwa ibn Ruwaym said that Allah's statement, وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ means what? It means some of them were struck with lightning while others were watching. Allah resurrected those and struck the others with lightning. In other words, um, they saw the punishment befalling upon some of them. Some of them would actually witness that. And they also witnessed Allah resurrecting them. Which is mentioned in the next ayah. That Allah resurrected them again. Great signs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown them. Great signs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown them. So here we have another one of their crimes. Okay, which was the opposing of Allah's messenger and doubting him. Okay. So Ibn Kathir he mentions, and this is a very beautiful narration. Pay attention to this narration. There's a lot of benefits to be taken from it. Uh, Abdurrahman ibn Zayd ibn Aslam commented on this ayah. And he said that Musa returned from meeting with his Lord, carrying the tablets on which he wrote the Torah. Okay. And he found that they had worshipped the calf in his absence. Consequently, he commanded them to kill themselves. And they complied. And Allah forgave them. So we've covered that in the previous ayat. He said to them, these tablets have Allah's book. Okay? Containing what he commanded you and what he forbade for you. So he came now with the Torah. They said, should we believe this statement because you said it? By Allah. We will not believe until we see Allah in the open. Until he shows us himself and says, this is my book. Therefore, adhere to it. Why does he not talk to us as he has talked to you, O Musa? Subhanallah. Look at their disrespect to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Remember Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam's statement? Yarhamullahu Musa. Udi akthara min thalika fa sabar. When someone came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam and accused him and disrespected him, he remembered his brother Musa alayhi salam. And he said, may Allah have mercy on Musa. Indeed he was harmed more than that and he was patient. Look at this. Saying to him, we want to see Allah ourselves, for ourselves, we're not going to accept it from you. So what is the greatest benefit we can take from this narration? And uh, we haven't uh, shared WooClub yet. Let's fire up WooClub quickly, so that I can ask a few questions, keep you engaged. Bismillah, Just give me one second. Okay, so uh, join us on WooClap, inshallah. I posted the link. Someone asked, is the correct understanding to say Al Khaliq means creator but doesn't necessarily denote creating from scratch? Merely creating it so it could carry the meaning of recreating something that exists? While Al-Bari first refers to the originator who creates from scratch. Yes, that's also one of the meanings of Al-Bari. Nah. Al-Bari means the originator. Whereas Al-Khaliq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Khalaq Al-Alim, He constantly creates. Even things that were created before Allah recreates them. Sah? But Al-Bari means the originator. Who created something without a previous inspiration if you like. Okay? So again, every name from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has unique meanings. They might be related to each other, but there are subtle differences. This being one of them. Type. Okay, so if you are on WooClap, the question is, uh, contemplating on this narration, what is the greatest benefit you can take from this narration? Okay, I'll read the narration again, if you want me to. Um, but let me post the question first.
you can see the screen right what's the difference between ta'ib and tawab ta'ib means someone who repents and in Allah's right it would mean, it would mean uh, the one who accepts the repentance of his servants but tawab means it's the same meaning but it also denotes it being done consistently constantly a lot being done a lot so Allah constantly accepts our repentance and he ex accepts repentance a lot from all of his servants so the sigha mubalagha it shows you that the same verb but it makes it more extensive if you like tayyib so the narration what do we benefit from it um, opposing the messenger can use asbab okay one minute opposing the messenger can cause adab in this life before the adab in akhirah naam mashallah be careful with stubbornness. Naam. Okay. Because they done the art of stubbornness. Allah is so forbearing. Naam. Subhanallah. Naam. Because even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took them. And they died on the spot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still resurrected them. And gave them another chance. Okay. Likewise, Musa alayhi salam also being very forbearing. By accepting, not accepting this, but putting up with this from Banu Israel. Always obey Allah and His Rasul. It will benefit in both worlds. The mercy of Allah, despite the arrogance and audacity of Banu Israel, to be patient no matter what. Do not think your sin is too great to be forgiven. The dangers of shirk and commit na'am. Um, Allah is so forgiving, na'am. Patience while giving da'wah. Absolutely, that's a great benefit. Musa continued giving them da'wah. He didn't give up. Even though this was their state. Okay. Now one benefit I want to share with you. That I have. If you like. Felt in this in this narration is. That whoever. Rejects the narrations of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After coming to know of it. Or after coming to know of them. And their own, and their own authenticity. Then he has a re resemblance to the Jews. Okay, so now it's Musa. It's Musa's narration. Coming to them, saying to them, this is the Torah from Allah. This narration from the Prophet Musa to Banu Israel, what did they do? They rejected it. They doubted their messenger. They doubted their Prophet. So anyone in this Ummah who rejects the narrations of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam after coming to know of the narration and knowing that it's authentic, through an authentic chain of narration, then indeed he has resembled Banu Israel in that regard. So this is a clear refutation of the Qur'aniyun, those that say we only follow the Qur'an and they reject the Hadith. Okay? As if they are doubting Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and his truthfulness. Okay? And it's also a refutation of anyone who rejects the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And we'll come back to this benefit inshallah towards the end. Because this, this is indeed one of the greatest takeaways. Type. Uh, what was their punishment? What was their punishment? Their punishment obviously was death. Okay? This crime of death, opposing the messenger, doubting the messenger, saying we want to see Allah directly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them immediately, there and then. Their punishment was that they died on the spot. Okay? So we benefit from this that some deeds are only expiated by capital punishment, even if the sinner repents. Okay? So such as someone killing someone else, or adultery, yes? Even if the person repents, Allah's hukum and Allah's ruling is that his life is taken. Okay? Why is that the case? Isn't Allah the most merciful? Isn't Allah a tawab al rahim Shouldn't we show this killer mercy instead of um, uh, d d instead of falling down to his level, like some people would say? Yes? Okay, he killed someone. Shouldn't we show him? That killing is wrong. Should we show him the right example? La. That's incorrect. Why? Because for many reasons. But one of them is for the greater good. Because if the murderer knows that he's going to be forgiven for murdering someone. Or there's possibility uh, or for parole or whatever. Then obviously he would be more likely to commit the sin. But if he knows that his life depends on it. And that there's no way out of it. 
Yes, and he's not just going to get a, a 15 year sentence. Okay, and, and, and be eligible for parole after 10 years. Then obviously he's going to think twice before he takes another person. So, طيب. Question. Hasn't Musa also requested from Allah that he sees him? Huh? So, what's wrong with Banu Israel saying that they want to see Allah? Alright? Let me pause down Wuklap. Okay, so what's wrong with Banu Israel also requesting to see Allah? If we obviously overlook the fact that they said to Musa, we won't believe in you. Okay? That obviously in of itself is a crime that deserves punishment. But if we overlook that fact, when they say, not Allah jahra, we want to see Allah plainly. We want to see Him. We want to gaze at Him. Didn't Musa say to his Lord, uh, Allah mentions in Surah Araf, Rabbi Arini Anzur Ilaik, Musa said to his Lord, Oh Allah, allow me to, to look at you. Okay? Someone said, but he repented after he asked. Musa alayhi salam is a prophet. La, 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 that's a wrong answer. That cannot be right. The prophets of Allah, they are the furthest away from doing something that warrants punishment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look that doesn't just overlook what a prophet does just because he's a prophet. Rather Allah chose them to be a prophet because they are far from such a crime. A crime that deserves immediate punishment. So no, to say Musa was a prophet that's a wrong answer. And I can see that uh, quite a few of you mentioned that. Musa had direct communication with Allah other than Banu Israel. Nah, that's also a wrong answer. Okay, it's not because of Wasita or the connection or because he's closer to Allah. Musa can say, Oh Allah, I want to see you in Banu Israel. It's not, I'm not allowed to ask for that. Okay? So, yes, so some. This is a, a good answer, mashallah. Musa asked out of certainty. Banu Israel asked out of stubbornness. Ahsant, barakallahu feek. Ahsant. That's the correct answer. And Sheikh Ibn Uthameen mentioned this in his tafsir. He says that Farqun bayna qawl Musa Rabbi arini anzur ilayk wa bayna qawl haula lan nu'mina laka hatta anar Allah jahra. He said there's a great difference between the two. What's the difference? Musa qala thalika shawqan ila Allah azza wa jal wa liyatalazzadha birru'yati ilayh. Musa asked to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of Shawq, if you like, longing to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Because he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's longing to see him. But these guys, they said it. Why? From a state of, of tashakkuk, of having doubts. They're saying to Musa, we're not going to accept from you. We want Allah himself to command us. We want to see Allah and he needs to tell us that this is my book. We're not going to accept it from you. They didn't ask to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they look forward to seeing him or are longing to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not why they asked. Okay? So they said, we're not going to believe until we see Allah. So there's indeed a great difference between the two requests. Okay? Barakallahu feekum. Now, like we said, immediate punishment. Allah says, The thunderbolt took you immediately. But even though that's the case, still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forbearing with his slaves. Once again, Allah says, مِن بَعْدِ مَوْتِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Then we revived you after your death so that you might be grateful. So Allah revived them immediately. Okay? Now after Allah revived them, but they already died, is that khalas, that's it? They don't need to do good deeds anymore? They're not expected to worship Allah anymore. That's it. They already went to Akhirah. And all these come to an end after death, don't they? How about this situation here? Like, this is different. This is different. Okay? Uh, and Ibn Kathir talked about this in detail and he mentioned a few opinions. But if we just go back to the narration that we saw previously uh, from Rabi' ibn Anas, where he said 
death was their punishment and they were resurrected after they died so they could finish out their lives so their life didn't come to an end their life actually didn't come to an end they still had you know uh, agile left they still have their, their their lifespan didn't finish yet so they came back to fulfill and complete their lifespan but if this death was a death that came because their lifespan was done then khalas, they would never be resurrected until the day of judgment rather this death of theirs was nothing but a punishment it was the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they died their death wasn't because their lifespan came to an end okay so you have to know the difference between those two things now what are some of the main takeaways to be taken from today's lesson okay I'll share two with you one of them that opposing Allah's messenger leads to death opposing Allah's messenger leads to death Naam. It happened with Banu Israel. They opposed Musa alayhi salam, they died immediately. Now I'm going to ask you a question. There's an ayah in the Quran that mentions the dangers of opposing the Prophet's command. Who knows the ayah? Who knows the ayah? You can transliterate it in in Arabic if you in English if you like. Or you can um Right, the reference or whatever. There's an ayah in the Quran that specifically talks about the dangers of opposing the Prophet's command. You can say the surah it's in if you like. Who knows the ayah? Very important ayah. All of you should memorize that verse. Subhanallah. It's also mentioned in Kitab al-Tawheed. And Imam Ahmed's got a beautiful statement regarding it. Okay, the ayah is. I'll give it 10 more seconds for you to answer. Someone asked, death is punishment in their case because of the pain of death. Well, yeah, obviously, when the thunderbolt overtook them, that must have been painful. So that was the punishment. But then they came back to life. Okay, so the ayah is, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, those who, op- uh, someone said, nah, those who oppose prophets, command should be scared that a trial befall them. Nah. فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Allah says in Surah An-Nur Then let those who oppose His command beware that a trial might befall them. A trial might befall them. Imam Ahmad mentioned in tafsir of this ayah, do you know what fitna means in this ayah? الْفِتْنَةُ الشِّرْك the trial mentioned this ayah is shirk. So Allah is saying, beware that you oppose the messenger. Because fitna might befall you. Such that you fall into shirk. And you leave the fold of Islam. Naam, opposing the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his sunnah, wallahi, it leads to leaving the fold of Islam. That's why the scholars would say, al-bid'atu baridu shirk. That bid'ah leads to shirk. The greatest thing that leads to shirk and people leaving the fold of Islam is bid'ah innovation and opposing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, that's why on the day of judgment, when these people come and they want to drink from the hold of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they will be they will be rejected and they will be pushed away from the hold by the angels. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, oh, "These are my this is my nation. These are my people." They will say, "You don't know what they have." Innovated and introduced into the religion after you. And he will say, suhqan, suhqan liman ghayyara wa baddal. Okay? So obviously, innovation is of two levels. There's innovation that takes you out of the fold of Islam, bid'a mukaffirah, and there are innovations that don't take you out of the fold of Islam. But one thing is for sure, no matter how small the innovation, innovations, they start small and they increase and they become bigger and bigger until they take you out of the fold of Islam. That's why that small group of people that were counting, count, counting dhikr with beads or with stones, Yes, who Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he told them off. What happened to them? What, what, what was their end result? The end result is that they were fighting the companions radiallahu anhum along with the khawarij. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the khawarij have left the fold of Islam. And this is one of the strongest opinions that khawarij are not Muslim. Even though scholars have differed upon that. But nevertheless, opposing Allah's messenger leads to death. That's one thing. Okay? 
Now, when we say it leads to death, you might say, okay, are you trying to say, Ustad, that those who oppose Allah's Messenger, you know, they're going to die? They're going to get cancer? They're going to get heart failure? Huh? They'll, they'll probably end up in a car accident? La, not necessarily. As a matter of fact, that would be better for them than the greater death. There's a death that's far more dangerous than the death that we know. Okay? What death is that? The death of your heart. Wallahi, take this as a principle. The death of your heart is worse than the death of your body. Wallahi. Why? Because the death of your heart will lead you to eternal punishment in hellfire. If you oppose the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Allah ta'ala punishes you immediately in this world by way of worldly calamity, wallahi, that is better for you. The greater calamity is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes you by taking away from you the ni'mah and the blessings of Islam. That's the greater punishment. Such that your heart dies before your body. Okay? That's why Imam al Qayyim mentions in a statement that we are more in need of knowledge and guidance than the air that we breathe. Why? Because if, if we don't have air to breathe, our bodies will die. But if we don't have knowledge and guidance, our hearts will die. Which is more far worse. He also has another statement, which is that uh, the true man is the one who fears the death of his heart, not the death of his body. Most people fear the death of their bodies and are not concerned with the death of their hearts. They do not know of life except the materialistic or the material part of it. So, my dear brothers and sisters, you should be more concerned with preserving the health of your heart than the health of your body. Wallahi. Unfortunately, something that most people they overlook. When it comes to their heart, no problem. They do all those things that are harmful to their hearts. By watching things that are haram, by mixing with misguided people, by reading shubuhat, by watching YouTube videos uh, that uh, spread shubuhat and doubts about the religion, by out of curiosity watching videos of people of innovation, or what have you. All these things that can lead to the death of your heart. If, when it comes to your body, you would never do that. You would never eat maybe something that is not to be a known carcinogen, for example, that it causes cancer. Or you find yourself avoiding, you know, food that is unhealthy for you. But when it comes to the, your heart, la, you don't take it serious. Take this as a principle. The death of your heart, wallah, is far worse than the death of your body. So now, Banu Israel, they died there and then. Sah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have kept them alive and just taken away from them. The Prophet Musa alayhi salam and taken away from them all guidance. That would have been far worse for them. Then them dying and coming back to life so that they can live a life upon upon Islam. Type. Also, the final takeaway is the importance of returning back to the books of Tafsir. We already touched on this. The fact that you can't really translate the Quran directly or word for word. But I want you to contrast between Two ayahs, two verses. The verse we took today where Allah says, فَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Kill yourselves. And there's another verse in Surah Tunisa where Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't kill yourselves. <laughs> okay? Now, if you don't return back to the books of Tafsir, you might get confused. You might be like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here Allah says, kill yourselves. There Allah says, don't kill yourselves. If you're smart, you'll be like, okay, wait a minute. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah is talking to us. The Ummah of Muhammad, we shouldn't kill ourselves, suicide is haram. فَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ This was Allah's statement to Banu Israel. Probably maybe suicide was permissible in their time. لا. That would have been a way to get out of it. But nevertheless, even that would be incorrect. Rather, this same statement can have two different meanings. Kill yourselves, i.e. you kill yourself. Or kill yourselves, i.e. you, plural, kill yourselves, yani one, some of you kill others. And it all goes back to the kum at the end, which is the plural here. Because in English, you or yourselves, you know, is uh, yani you in English stands for the singular, one person. You can, To one person you can say you. To two people you can say you. To three people you can say you. It's all you. I can be talking to uh, millions of people. I can say you guys. And I can talk to one guy and I can say to him you. Okay, so in English, you, 
doesn't differentiate between singular, plural, dual, whatever. It's all the same. In Arabic, no. Okay? Uqtul nafsak is one. If Allah said, Uqtul nafsak like that, then that would be, it, would, it would definitely mean kill yourself. Because now it's just singular. But faqtulu anfusakum, kill yourselves, it can have two meanings. Okay? One, kill yourselves. Some of you kill others because it's addressing a whole group of people. Or kill yourselves as in each one of you kill their own selves. Now, this ambiguity, if you like, in the language, what's the way out? What's the way out? The way out is that you return back to the books of tafsir, the authentic books of tafsir. Why? Because the authentic books of tafsir, they rely upon the correct sources of tafsir, which we've mentioned before are four. Four main ones. Number one, the Quran itself. So in order to make tafsir of the Quran, you return back to the Quran. Allah might have clarified this ayah and its meaning in another verse. Or you return back to the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Because Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ Allah says, O oh Muhammad, we have not sent down this Quran to you except that you clarify to people what has been revealed to them. Naam, this Quran, it needs clarifications in some places. Okay? So if Muhammad sallallahu had to clarify some of the meanings of the Quran to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, who were masters of the language, then how about us? Okay, so now we have to return back to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in order to know what it means. The sunnah tells us without doubt and without any ambiguity that suicide is haram. So definitely the ayah can't mean that. Okay, then you return back to the tafsir of the sahaba and the salaf generally speaking. Okay, and then you also return back to tafsir of the Quran by way of the language itself and looking at how the Arabs use these sort of uh, statements or these sort of words. Okay. So that's why you can't, when, and th this advice from me to all of you, if you hear someone quoting an ayah from the Quran to try and prove his point, don't just fall for it. Don't be like, oh, subhanAllah, Allah's statement, he said. And then to double check, you go and you grab the first translation you can find, you're like, oh yeah, subhanAllah, it's so true, that's what Allah said. No, no, because these translations are literal translations. Rather, whenever you have any doubt about an ayah, Go back to the books of Tafsir. Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah. Tafsir Ibn Kathir is translated to English. Tafsir Al Imam Al Sa'ad is translated to English. I remember there was a, I think a clip that I retweeted a couple of weeks ago by Sheikh Sulman Rahili where he talks about Tafsir Ibn Sa'adi and its importance. Wallah, a house, household that doesn't have Tafsir Ibn Sa'adi at home, it's a, it's a poor household. It's a poor household. So Tafsir Ibn Sa'adi, rahimahullah ta'ala, has been translated. You've got Tafsir Al-Mukhtasar, it's also translated. Now, before you take somebody's statement, when it comes to any verse, go back to the books of Tafsir. And if you know Arabic, Alhamdulillah, the whole world has opened up to you. You can open Tafsir Ibn Uthaymeen, uh, Tafsir uh, Al-Baghawi, Tabari, you name it. Okay, you can open up all these Tafsirs if you like. Okay, but the point I'm trying to make is what? The importance of returning back to the books of tafsir. Never rely on a translation of the Quran. Or somebody quoting uh, an ayah from the Quran then translating word for word. You always have to ask, wait a minute, what did the Mufassirun say about that? Let me go and double check. Okay? Muhammad. And this wallah you find most of the misguidance that a lot of the Muslims have fallen into is because of this. It's because of this. Because they don't return back to the books of Tafsir and then they just fall for the next guy who quotes an ayah from the Quran. And then, khalas, subhanAllah, Allah said, لا أبدا. From the time of the companions, radiallahu anhum, the khawarij were using ayat from the Quran to justify fighting the Sahaba. That's why the Prophet وسلم, said that هلاك أمتي في الكتاب واللبن We shared the hadith before. He said that the destruction of my ummah is in the book and in, 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 in milk. We explained what, 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 what that means. The destruction of this ummah being in the book, not because the Quran misguides, la. Rather because people, they go to the Quran without returning back to the correct sources, without returning back to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad and then they misquote the ayat and that leads to their misguidance. Because we know that every Muslim, every Muslim loves Allah's kalam, loves Allah's, Allah's words. 
And the people of innovation, they know that. They know that the book of Allah is the greatest means that they can use to draw everyone near. They use it as a bait. They know that. They know the book of Allah and every Muslim loves the book of Allah. So we shouldn't, be, uh, we shouldn't fall for that. So because of the fact that they know it, they go look in the Quran trying to find some ayah that they can use and they can misquote to aid their innovation. And that's what they do. Every person of innovation will say to you, will come with an ayah from the Quran to prove their innovation. Okay? But, does that mean the Quran is a proof for them? لا أبدا. What is the way out? The way out is that we return back to the Sunnah of the Prophet, we return back to the Quran, you return back to the Tafsir of the Sahaba and the Salaf. What does that mean in the destruction of milk? Um, it's not that anything wrong with milk, but basically, it's, it's basically uh, talking about dunya, right? And you know, um, following the dunya and not uh, giving much uh, importance to akhirah. Okay, obviously, milk wasn't as easily available back then as it is today, right? Milk was a big thing. Only farmers and people that go out and and leave the city in order to look after their cattle and stuff, they would have access to milk, right? So it's basically talking about, you know, f f going the cattle life and, you know, just leaving the city, leaving knowledge, leaving guidance, you know, isolating yourself, and then that could lead to uh, misguidance and destruction. What is the difference between the trial upon the disbelievers and the trial upon the faithful Muslims? Well, the trial upon the faithful Muslims in order for them, for the sins to be expiated, Allah only tests His slaves in order to to expiate their sins and in order to increase their rank. Whereas the trial of the disbeliever is punishment. It's punishment. And it only leads to the more misguidance for them. So there's a major difference between the two. So how do you know then? How do you know if a trial is good for you or bad for you, it's very simple. You look at your situation. If Allah tries you and it increases you in Iman or closeness to Him and it doesn't lead to your misguidance, then Alhamdulillah, that means there's a lot of khair in you. Inshallah, you have Iman. If, however, trials lead to your misguidance, trials lead to you leaving the fold of Islam, trials lead to you leaving the Sunnah, then that shows that you have a disease in your heart and your state is really bad. Okay? Bye. Bye. Inshallah, I think um, we're done. I don't think I did all right. We went 10 minutes over time. Uh, that's actually a point I wanted to uh, make, which is the tafsir class. Um, Obviously, I put in the duration for the event an hour. Sah? But I don't think an hour is enough. I don't think an hour is enough. I don't think it is enough. So, what shall we do about that? There are a couple of options. Number one, and I'll put them on WooClap. Let's see what you think. Um, either we can make the lesson an hour and a half. 1.5 hours all we can do is we can have one hour lesson followed by break and then another or let's say not say one hour let's say 15 minutes right and then another 15 minutes or maybe try and look for another day because I want to do more I want to cover more as well and at the same time, uh, I don't want to sit for any one period longer than an hour. So which of these do you think we should do? Um, how shall we spend longer on tafsir? Let me know what you think, inshallah. Shall we make the lesson an hour and a half straight? Or shall we do like a 15 minute lesson? Followed by a break and then another 50 minutes. Or shall we just look for another day and just stick to one hour strictly. And just look for another day. Which 
I can't guarantee, but if that's the what most of you want, then we'll look into that, inshallah. I like the screen a little bit so that people are influenced by other people's answers. An hour and a half. Take a break for those who need to make salah. Well, that's a bit difficult because salah time is always going to change. Sometimes salah time might be as soon as we start. Sometimes it might be towards the end. So unfortunately, with the different time zones, it's impossible to cater for salah. Not even different time zones, different countries. Even those of you in the UK. Those in London pray at a certain time. Those in Birmingham pray like 10 minutes later. Those up north pray 15, 20 minutes after that doesn't make sense we can't we cannot cater for salah times unfortunately anyone that needs to go salah needs to go salah and then they can catch up uh, on the youtube stream inshallah someone said 30 minutes till dhuhr there i don't know which country that is from <laughs> for us it's 15 past 10 about to go to sleep and one brother here said it's 30 minutes till dhuhr <laughs> so <laughs> see what i mean usa california mashallah I think a break is helpful in between lectures are very beneficial. I agree with that. Let's see what most people most people are saying an hour and a half straight. Most people are saying an hour and a half straight. Uh, I might repost the question on the channel, inshallah, given that only twenty of you have answered. Time. Alas, whatever is easy for you, Steph. Zakallah khair. Time no worries, inshallah. I'll probably I'll, I'll, I'll repost that question inshallah in the, in, the, in the channel to give you more time to answer inshallah Adawallahu alayhi wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad Barakallahu feekum inshallah I'll see all of you next week for now inshallah Nah Yeah it's sleep time for me definitely Assalamu alaikum Please uh, you're gonna receive an email eh? straight after the lesson if you haven't received it already for feedback your feedback is always appreciated especially the critical type of it or the constructive criticism uh, so inshallah don't hold back barakallahu feekum assalamu alaikum i think the question on the channel is more representative true inshallah I'll do that inshallah even though i, I kind of like disagree of it being more representative mainly because we have almost 800 people on the channel but about 80 of you attend so you have to keep that in mind. Some of you are in different time zones, they're in the channel, but they always watch the replay. So I think the most representative to uh, to an extent are those people that are attending live. You know, I might ask it on the channel and then, you know, maybe 80% of the people that, that, that answer on the channel might not even be attending these classes. So I might ask it again next lesson, inshallah, towards the beginning. But I don't really think the channel is more representative, to be honest. طيب حياكم الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته